Welcome. Great, thank you. Welcome for coming. And um, disruptive innovation uh, was sort of first coined by um, Clayton Christensen back in 1995. Um, any technology that has the power not only to um, to replace, but to render obsolete all technologies that, that came before it. And we're seeing a huge change in technology at the moment, not just simply electronics, but in the whole way that data is stored, retrieved, shared. And today is going to be give you a little bit of an insight into what we're doing in the field of drone technology. Uh, but not just the drone itself, but all the technology that goes behind the drones. So, the iPhone revolutionized telephones. It rendered obsolete the Nokia phones um, because straight away it was no longer a communication device. It was a device for sharing information. It was a device for recording yourself. Um, you know, anybody who holds one of these in their hand immediately becomes a media broadcasting station. You can live stream, you can interrupt, you can disrupt the normal channels of communication. And, you know, to the point where some people are saying that YouTube is now the real media. It's the real people telling real stories. And this whole idea of fake news, people supplanting real news with their own version of events that are unvetted is quite a disturbing and disruptive um, influence on, on media today. Donald Trump is always lamenting about it. Um, but, you know, it's only back in 1957 we launched the first satellite. Um, 1995, I couldn't believe it until I started looking at it again myself. 1995, we had the first GPS constellation. <coughs> Prior to that, we had no GPS. And very quickly, the world's come to rely on GPS. We rely on GPS all the time, every time we send a message that tells us what location we were in. You know, my, my daughter tracks all her friends on Friend Tracker, which is quite disturbing as well. But now there are over a thousand active satellites in space, 500,000 pieces of space junk um, in our immediate sort of microcosm around the Earth, and that presents its own problems. And it, it's got, got so bad uh, as an issue for global technology that companies like Google are resorting to low Earth orbit satellite systems. Systems like this one that will be delivering internet to places like Africa. So we've got now effectively three stratospheres of technology. We've got our um, mid-Earth orbit satellites, we've got our uh, upper Earth orbit satellites, we've got our low Earth orbit, and we've got our near Earth orbit perpetual flying drones going around the planet, sharing information, relaying uh, information and it's giving us the best picture we've ever had of our Earth. What has this got to do with, with landscape architecture? Um, if you look at the, the Wright brothers launching their the first manned heavier than air aircraft back in 1903, it's not dissimilar to these very shaky launches of these new drones we've got circling the Earth that are starting to be autonomous. Um, and that's giving us the ability to start as designers collecting our own information, actually having our own uh, ability to go out and verify facts for ourselves. Um, a good example, which I'll show later on, is I've started a new project about five minutes walk from here, Creekside Deptford, and the, the engineering team have said we don't know what the, 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 the Creekside wall looks like, we don't know what condition it's in, and I went out in half an hour, I could build a 3D model of that Creekside wall. I could go out and verify the facts for myself. So this is disrupting the normal chain of events in a cycle of the design analysis uh, approach. Uh, as a landscape architect, we are not reliant on the surveyor going out and surveying a piece of land and giving us the information. Um, not, we're not reliant on being the last person in the design team appointed. We can actually go out and be the first person on the project and in 2015, I started a new company called Survey Drone. Uh, Survey Drone's job was not to go out and start making money. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Survey Drone's job was to go out and get us the first job on the, on the project, to get us in at the front end of the project, where we could actually be the master planner rather than the tail end of the process. It's put us in the driving seat of the project because we are now able to go out and assess, 
determine the flood risk, determine the viability of development of a piece of land, determine the value of the piece of land for the client, before the client's even acquired the land, before anybody's even stepped on the land, we can have appraised its value for our clients. Now, that puts us in a very powerful position as planners, as designers, uh, because we are now able to drive the process from the front end rather than from the back end. So traditionally, my practice was built on our ability to model the land, hydrology, sustainable drainage, ecological transformation of damaged and uh, contaminated land, mining reclamation sites. And we were always at the, the whim, the mercy of the surveyors who would say, well, we're going to take 12 weeks to survey this and we're going to charge a lot of money. And the client saying, well, that's a lot of money invested just in finding out whether a piece of land is viable or not. We said, look, don't worry about that, forget that. We'll do the entire process. We'll survey it, we'll appraise it, we'll look at the context and we'll look at the developability of the land. So, 2014, before we started Survey Drone, this is a scheme in Africa, uh, near Nairobi. 1,200 homes are proposed, and the architect, who is the master planner of the scheme, says we'd like to do a mini competition between landscape architects to see which landscape architect we want to appoint to the landscape design. And this whole idea of the landscape design as a tack on, as a as a component of the master planning process, I find really disturbing. We said to the architect, we'd like to have the contours for the site, and the architect said, why? Why do you need the contours to do the concept? I said, it's fundamental to the design process. So they gave us the contours, and we won the, the, the appointment for the project based on the fact that we said the master plan is flawed, around <coughs> 40 or 50 of the homes in this site will be flooded during a monsoon rain event and because we flagged that up very um, cautiously with our, our architect who was going to be our, our client they said okay you've got the job um, to come in and reappraise our master plan um, now that process took two weeks because mainly we were at the mercy of getting the information fast forward to a project we've done recently in the UK we took that whole process on ourselves and completed it in three days complete modeling, capture of data, analysis, um, looking at hydrology, looking even at ecology. We can produce 3D models that actually enable us to uh, go out and evaluate a lot of environmental conditions, not just topography. We can do uh, vegetation analysis. So we've developed what we call this drone integration route map. And as I said before, the, the person holding this in their hand is a broadcasting platform. I'd like to invite my assistant, uh, Tom, to come up and just show you what the future of the landscape technology is. If this is the key to um, being an a empowered person in the information. Have you got the drone there, Tom? Are you going to bring it up? What have, you, what have you done with it? You had it a minute ago. <coughs> Oh, there it is. Right. In your pocket. So, you know, with this, uh, I'm no longer a landscape architect. I'm now a surveyor. I'm now an engineer. I'm now an ecologist. So I'm able to actually walk around site and capture data of sufficiently high quality with this. 4K four, four, um, uh, camera, 12 megapixel sensor, uh, and it's getting to the point where you've got multiple sensors on these things as well. So, literally, plug your mobile phone into that, and, and you're a surveyor in your pocket, anywhere in the world. And we'll show you some examples of that. So, people always manifest on the drone. They say, wow, drones, no, drone technology. <coughs> this is a piece of dumb electronics. It has no intelligence in it whatsoever. The intelligence is built into the software that we use to process that information. The raw data capture starts with flight planning software that enables us to tile up the piece of land um, to create parcels and overlaps of data. This will record GPS images to 10 decimal places. 10 decimal places of GPS data is the equivalent of um, a letter on an A4 piece of paper from a height of half a kilometer. 
sounds unbelievable, but it's true. So this is basically the, the, the data capture process, going outside with a drone, collecting images, getting that information back to your office, uploading that information to the cloud, and having it processed in a, on a server farm in California. Having the survey back on my desk about three or four hours later. And that information is taking GPS information uh, combined with, with photographs of high quality, overlapping the data and producing 3D geometry. And that enables us to create meshes over which we can start to overlay the photographic images and recreate the landscape electronically. Now, this is one of the very first models we did. Very, very primitive. 200,000 faces of information. That is a primitive model. That is something I can produce, you can produce on a laptop or a, or a PC. The kind of models we're doing right now, at a much larger scale, involve up to 2 million vertices in a single model. Much bigger than a single PC can process. And not only that, but once you get the information back, you've got huge amounts of interpolation to do. So, this is a scheme we've, we've done last year in Equatorial Guinea, in Africa, surveying a site. Uh, we went out there to, to collect data with the drone. We did, it was one of our very first major projects, and the local surveyor gave us ground control points. When we came back from Africa, we found those ground control points to be up to three meters out, three meters in accuracy. That's about as accurate as Google Earth is. So I could go out and get that, literally just downloading from Google Earth. What we were able to do from a height of half a kilometer is get information down to the nearest five centimeters of accuracy uh, in, a, in a process that took us around three hours to survey. Most of the time spent just actually getting through security with the drones. Um, and, we, and we get the information back and you can see the kind of accuracy we're getting. I mean, you can actually start to see minor channels, rivulets in streams, you know, in, in, in road embankments. Really high quality data collected very quickly. We could have gone much more detailed if we wanted to and spent days doing it, but we didn't have the time. Now, one of the biggest issues we have with this data is that you've got the trees being modelled as if they were landform. So the trees actually obstruct your ability to see the land. And it's one of the biggest issues facing um, at high altitude collected data. Even LiDAR is having trouble getting canopy penetration. So we've been circumventing this with, with technology. We've been taking meshes and models that we get back, and we've been saying to the, the computer, creating algorithms using Rhino and Grasshopper to filter the data. We're saying anything that sticks more than five meters up above the landscape, treat it as an anomaly and wipe it out, erase it from the model. So we're able to identify the anomalies through these the processes. So on the, the, the left is the, 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 the model, the mesh. On the right is the filtering process for all the points of data, 20 million points of data. So it takes a lot of time and a lot of processing power. We can filter out those anomalies. And we can say, OK, take those anomalies and bring them back down to a calibrated ground level and create a new output mesh. OK, thank you. Well, correct it. It was gone quickly. Um, it was Tom. It's your fault. Uh, you're too slow getting up here with the drone. Um, so we can also start to look at information processing with that. So we can take that new evaluated mesh into modeling programs like um, Civil 3D. And we can start to analyze that for hydrology, gradient mapping, uh, producing contours. Uh, this is the gradient map of the site. And starting looking at watershed analysis. So coming back to our original proposal was to make ourselves better at hydrology assessment to better augment our SUDS design capabilities, where they are able to go out and not only be the SUDS designer, but we're able to be the surveyor and the data collector. Uh, to start to bring in uh, new things now, like BIM modeling, actually modeling 3D geometry for buildings. I'm going to rush through these quickly now. Um, and that's a fully automated process that has gone and evaluated the roofscape and given the building dimensions. It's only a short step from that to get to full 3D modeling capabilities. The other day, this is the model I produced for Creekside Wall. This is a full interactive 3D model the design team can now use. And this has only been brought about by a convergence of big data sets, cloud processing, availability of broadband, and mobile phone communication technology. 
combined with GPS, constellations. We now have five constellations in space, not one. So we're able to tap into GLONASS, uh, GPS. We've now got the Chinese Baidu system. There's an Indian uh, constellation being created at the moment. And we've got the Galileo European network. So we're able to use any of those networks. Plug into huge data processing capability, much bigger capability than we could ever have in our own office, and get that back. Um, so you can see that the huge surge in digital data. We entered the digital age in 2002, where more than half of our data was stored digitally rather than in analog. You can see since 2005 how graphic cards have bloomed in size. And this gives a visual representation of the size of the data sets that have been created. <coughs> So if a, an, a large novel is the size of an ant, the amount of data uh, being collected about the Earth right now is the size of the sun. So a huge explosion. And that explosion is being driven by the availability of internet and broadband <coughs> access around the world. So will computers ever replace humans? Will they replace designers? Is our job at risk of being replaced by artificial intelligence? I think the answer is, is no. Because the design process relies, this is from a, a film, uh, I encourage you to follow the link and have a look at it about how computers could or potentially are able to re replace designs. The problem is that the design process, well the good thing about it is that the design process relies on imagination. Understanding the essence of two things combined to create something new. So there are certain parts of the design process that will be replaced by computers, by intelligent mapping but there are certain parts of the design process that can't be replaced, they can't be replicated by a machine, at least not in our lifetime. So the things that are likely that this technology is going to disrupt are the manual processes, the survey analysis, drafting, modeling, visualization, technical design, graphic design, they're all at risk of being replaced by computers, but the conceptualization, consultation, understanding of human needs of landscape, the cultural value, are things that are value judgments that computers can't make. So, to conclude, uh, disruptive innovation is happening in many sectors of, of the industry. We've proven that as, uh, by adopting this technology, we can go out and replace the early processes. We can supplant the landscape architect as the originator of the data, of the primary driver for the project, move into the driving seat of the entire process. But Let's not take my word for this. Let's ask a machine about their opinion of AI's capability to replace designers in the future. I'm already very interested in design, technology, and the environment. I feel like I can be a good partner to humans in these areas, an ambassador who helps humans to smoothly integrate and make the most of all the new technological tools and possibilities that are available now. It's a good opportunity for me to learn a lot about people. So be careful, that could be your next colleague in your next office. But just like the AI, the key to it is working with people. If we become detached from the human process, we are at risk of being made obsolete. It's the humanness in our design that keeps us being the protagonist and the leader in the technology of design. Thank you.